I'm Susan Euler. This program is about Vincent Van Gogh, who was a very troubled man and lived a tragic life, but produced some of the most beautiful art the world has ever seen. Paris in 1886 was an exciting place to be. The center for all things avant-garde, young artists flocked to the city to immerse themselves in art and a bohemian lifestyle. It was the era of pointillism, a post-impressionist style in which paintings are composed of individual dots, points, of brilliant, highly saturated colors. And it was also the heyday of Paris nightclubs, such as the infamous Moulin Rouge, which introduced wild, risque dances such as the Can-Can, which both shocked and delighted audiences who came from all over the world to become a part of this new, daring lifestyle. But it was also the era of a new drink, a drug really, called absinthe. Highly addictive and producing not just drunkenness, but hallucinations. Absinthe, the green fairy as it was called, ruined many lives. So, into this world of modern art, wild bohemian behavior, and drugs, a young man who had once hoped to become a minister arrived from Holland. This young man was Vincent van Gogh. Well, he wasn't so young actually, at least not in years. He was 33, but had already experienced a lifetime's worth of disappointments. Plagued with bouts of mental illness and depression since childhood, he had been living in poverty, subsisting only on bread, coffee, and tobacco, and drinking heavily when he wrote to his brother Theo asking if he could join him in Paris. Theo van Gogh was a successful art dealer, employed by Gopils, one of Europe's most prestigious art firms. Both brothers hoped that the move to Paris would be a new beginning for the struggling Vincent. Although largely self-taught, Vincent van Gogh was immensely talented and had only recently taken the higher level admissions exams at the Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp, Belgium, which he passed without difficulty. But he was too ill, depressed, and physically exhausted to attend. Today we are sometimes led to believe that Vincent van Gogh was unrecognized by the art establishment when he was alive. But this is not true. His dark, moody, somber still life peasant character studies and landscapes done between 1882 and 1885 were praised and exhibited in Holland. His early masterpiece, The Potato Eaters, had even attracted the attention of Paris art dealers. Paris had the desired effect on Van Gogh. Excited by everything he saw around him, he changed his painting style almost immediately. In a few months, he had abandoned his dark, somber color palette forever, using lighter, brighter colors instead, which were more in keeping with his improved sense of well-being. And he began experimenting with the pointless technique of dots and dashes, arriving at his signature, sketchy, elongated brushstroke in less than a year. And then he discovered Japanese art. Japanese art had been unknown in Europe until 1854, when the American Admiral Matthew Perry signed a treaty with the Shogun, opening up trade between Japan and the West. By the 1860s, both Americans and Europeans were mad for all things Japanese. In fact, Japanese art and culture became so much a part of the modern experience that the French coined a word for it, Japonisma. Like a great many 19th century artists, Van Gogh had long appreciated Japanese art, especially the woodblock prints, which were inexpensive and readily available. But it wasn't until he came to Paris that he began to incorporate Japanese design into his own paintings. Van Gogh taught himself how Japanese composition worked by making copies of Japanese prints. In this instance, he used a magazine illustration of a print by Isan to create his own painting of a courtesan. The original grid Van Gogh used to copy the magazine illustration by some miracle still exists. There are no known copies of the original print by Isan, although the one shown here is similar. Van Gogh followed this process of making his own versions of original Japanese prints until he felt familiar enough with Japanese design to incorporate it into his own paintings. 
Japanese art will have a profound effect on Van Gogh's style for the rest of his life. In 1888, the excitement generated by living, working, drinking, and arguing with his fellow artists gave Van Gogh an idea. Looking back 20 years to Manet and the early days of Impressionism, he decided to start an artist colony where painters could live together and work in a supportive environment. Of course, the volatile Van Gogh was not an ideal candidate for leading an artist colony, but he didn't see it that way. In 1887, Van Gogh had become friends with another painter, Paul Gauguin, a known wild man, a hard drinker, a notorious womanizer, and very self-absorbed. Gauguin would seem to have very little in common with Van Gogh, at least on the surface. But Gauguin and Van Gogh shared a similar painting style, and both were deeply religious, feeling increasingly alienated from what they agreed was a wickedly profane world. Incidentally, Although professing to be a staunch Catholic, Gauguin had deserted his wife and five children to pursue a career in art full-time. But moving past that. Fighting constantly with his brother Theo and exhausted from completing over 200 paintings in less than two years, Van Gogh decided to move to the south of France. Theo, who found living with Vincent almost unbearable, gladly paid five months rent in advance for a rundown duplex in the little town of Arles, where Vincent planned to set up his artist colony. Known to art history as the Yellow House, Van Gogh called it the Studio of the South, and set about furiously fixing it up in anticipation of Gauguin joining him. Gauguin wasn't all that eager to live with Van Gogh or take part in his fledgling artist colony, so he made excuse after excuse about why he could not travel to Arles. But Gauguin owed everyone money, and when Theo Van Gogh gave him 50 francs, no strings attached, if he would join his brother in the Yellow House, well, Gauguin relented. Even so, it took him five more months to finally show up. We all know how Van Gogh cut off part of his ear. Well, this is when it happened. While Van Gogh waited for Gauguin to arrive, his mood fluctuated wildly between buoyant optimism and blackest despair. As always, he channeled his energy into painting. Roaming the countryside in search of subject matter, he made dozens of paintings of sunflowers and fields in brilliant sunlight, in the style most associated with his mature work. But it was obvious from the image of the gaunt man with the shaved head, who peers out at the viewer in this painting, which he incidentally sent to Gauguin, that despair had the upper hand. Van Gogh was rapidly descending into madness. In a letter, Van Gogh had explained the shaved head as a religious statement, equating his appearance to that of a Buddhist monk. This concerned Gauguin. Therefore, when he arrived in Arles, he was not surprised to find Van Gogh in a state of emotional agitation. Gauguin tried to calm him by doing everything Van Gogh wanted, including painting outside directly in front of nature, which was not Gauguin's preferred method of working. But the yellow house was small, and the two volatile men soon found it impossible to live in such close proximity, especially once the weather turned cold and they had to remain indoors. To make matters worse, they began hanging out at a seedy cafe owned by one Madame Ginot. Called the Night Cafe in paintings by both Van Gogh and Gauguin, it was, in Van Gogh's words, a hell-like place for one could go mad. Well, on the night of December 23rd, while drinking heavily, Van Gogh became even more abusive than usual. According to Gauguin, he began preaching as if he were Christ and began ranting about sainthood and murder. In one account, Gauguin stated that Van Gogh leapt across the table at him, brandishing a razor. Well, this may not have happened. In any event, something happened that scared Gauguin so much that he spent the night in a hotel. When he returned to the Yellow House the following morning, he found it splattered with blood and the police at the scene. Van Gogh had cut off part of his ear, delivered it to a local brothel as a kind of religious relic, and then collapsed. The police took him to the hospital. 
All this made the papers. But it was only a temporary setback. On January 7th, Van Gogh returned to the Yellow House alone, where he began painting furiously. By May, however, it became obvious that he could no longer live outside a hospital. He voluntarily checked himself into a private psychiatric hospital in saint Remy, where he was given excellent and compassionate medical care. Van Gogh painted an astonishing number of works while at saint Remy, 243 in all, including his masterpiece, Starry Night. But once he was discharged, his mental illness quickly returned, and on July 27, 1890, he shot himself. Two days later, he died. Teo, his brother, was by his side. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Dr. Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in.